Can you tell us your name and where you're from? Yeah, my name is uh, really Maria Roque Madrid. Um, I live in San Acaso and that's where I was raised, but I was born in South Dakota. In a little town, a little shed actually, that's all there is there. It's called Igloo. And you'll find that in some maps and in other maps it's not even listed. That's, that's where I was born. My dad was a sheep herder. He was herding sheep in Wyoming. And when I was a week old, they came over to Santa Casa to introduce me to my grandparents. So they were going back to work. Mom kept saying, Grandma, we're leaving now, because uh, my grandma was holding me. And my grandma says, well, you have a real nice, safe trip. You know, be careful. Uh, what about Rocky? She said, what about him? She said, I'm keeping him. He's mine. You don't know anything about raising babies. You never had one before, she said. So, and I do. So I want to keep him. You go back, have a good, safe trip. So since I was seven days old, I got adopted by my grandparents. They raised me in San Acasio. And we used to grow a garden big enough to feed everybody for the whole summer. I mean, a big one. Uh, the population is one big change. Uh, in my high school graduation class in 1964, there was 47 or 48 students that graduated. I don't think there's even that many students in the whole school anymore. So we had a, a big population uh, drop after I left uh, high school. And after the Vietnam War, we had a, just a significant dive. I think the economy of agriculture and everything went down the drain when farmers started realizing that they could circumvent paying farm workers by planting food for animals instead. The way they wouldn't have to pay people to thin the lettuce and cultivate it and fertilize it and do everything that they did to it, and irrigate it and everything. So they circumvented the, the people that, that did the farm work. And then all of a sudden those people were out of work and they had to migrate to the cities or to other areas. And I want to say something and I don't want somebody else that doesn't understand the language to understand what I'm saying. I'll say it in Spanish, so I have an advantage. Probably, I, I would say it starts at the house, at home. Uh, if the parents are not setting the example by using the language themselves, they're losing it. And, and by losing it, it's a real sad thing. You know, it's a very beautiful language. And... Um, Parents of young kids should definitely be putting an emphasis on being, make sure that their kids are bilingual. Yeah. The school also should put a big emphasis on that. It's important. Uh, and I worked all over the country and uh, mostly in the northern area of the state, Denver, Boulder. But uh, for eight years I was a wilderness firefighter crew boss with Bureau of Land Management. And uh, we were flown to every forest fire from Colorado to New Mexico and Arizona, Nevada, California, Oregon, Idaho, Washington. All those states we covered fire fighting. And so I did that for eight years. And then when one day the big guy over me decided to put my crew in danger, I said, Rather than accepting that responsibility of having to go back and tell a bunch of parents that I'm sorry their kids died in a fire, I said, I'd rather leave the responsibility in your hands and I'll give you my hat, you can give me my check and I'm out of here. And so I quit and I went to Denver and worked as a flight paramedic for 27 years. I came here as often as I could. Every time I had an opportunity, I was in San Luis. When I was in college, I'd take off from Boulder after my three o'clock class, and I'd get to a baseline road and I'd hitchhike. And then people were into picking up hitchhikers, and people, a lot of people were into hitchhiking. So sometimes I would leave after my three o'clock class and arrive in San Acasio in time for a late dinner with my family around seven or eight on a Friday. Then I'd hitchhike back on a Sunday. So yeah, I came back as often as I could. I joined when I was in, still in high school because they had a program in the Marines where if you joined your junior or senior year and stayed in high school and graduated, they would knock a year off your, uh, and I think they still have that program, they knock a year off your, your uh, duty, uh, active duty. And so I stayed active duty for 
six, 13, like 19 months, year and a half, a little over a year and a half active. But I stayed 13 months, basically the first Marine Air Wing out of Iwakuni, Japan. I spent a lot of time bumming around the country, uh, hitchhiking around a lot, and, and just kind of getting my feel for, for what the country was all about, what was going on in the country. And when I did that, uh, I observed that they, we had one thing in common, everybody, and that's that we all wanted peace. And so we organized a whole bunch of different fronts with a common theme of peace. And we ended the Vietnam War, and not militarily. They kicked us in the butt and gave us a black eye and a bloody nose and threw us out militarily. So we didn't win the war militarily. We won the war in Vietnam by not even going there. We won the war in Vietnam in this country by protesting on the streets of the colleges and universities and those students at the colleges and universities going back home and organizing their communities right the, just down the block and around the corner and have the rest of the residents down the block and around the corner organize the next block and around the corner. And so all of a sudden there was a revolution going on. Uh, people were fighting for all kinds of different causes. Uh, the Symbionese Liberation Army was happening. That was the kidnapping of Patricia Hearst, uh, an heiress to uh, the William Randolph Hearst Foundation. And they told uh, her old man that in order to get her back, he would have to uh, promise Safeway or City Market somebody to give every person that went in $70 worth of groceries every day, every time they went in. So the man said, well, I can't produce that much. Otherwise, right well, we'll kill your daughter if you can't. So uh, they didn't kill her. They kept her. And then pretty soon she joined the organization, called her dad a fascist capitalist pig and, uh, and was shown on a photo on the newspaper holding an M16 in her arm like this, you know, saying SLA, Symbionese Liberation Army, on her shirt. Uh, so anyway, there, was a, there were all kinds of happenings. Uh, the one that I was involved in, I was in college, I was a sophomore, and wounded knee happened. And I don't know if you've read this in history, but in 1890, a massacre occurred in wounded knee, where they killed over 300 men, women, and children and burned them alive, burned their teepees with the babies inside. Uh, that happened in 1890. In 1973, conditions hadn't changed much. The Indians were still under the kind of oppression that they live in today. And Native Americans just wanted one thing. They were asking just to have Richard Wilson, the director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, removed because he was robbing them of their money and Everybody was getting ripped off, and, and they had tried everything, pickets, protests, demonstrations, courts, lawsuits, and Nixon wouldn't remove him. He wouldn't cooperate with the, in, the Native Americans. So uh, the elders in Wounded Knee called the American Indian Movement, and they said, can you guys lend us a hand to see if there's an alternate way that we could uh, bring this issue to the forefront so that the people around the country can hear what's going on here. So they said, yeah, we'll do it with nonviolence, and they kidnapped 300 people inside the village of Wounded Knee and held them hostage. And that happened on March 5th, 1973. On March 8th, around 1.30 in the morning, I got a phone call from a girl I had met while doing a trip, college trip in Chicago during that previous fall, uh, campaigning from a Governor Shriver campaign. And um, so I got, and then I'd see that Susan just in passing, you know, on campus once in a while, but it was just, hey, hi, how's it going, goodbye. I didn't really converse with her. Well, this one night on March 8th, at 1.30 in the morning, the phone rings. And I thought that was kind of unusual. So I answered the phone and it was that woman. And she said, uh, Rocky, we need a plane and a pilot to go to Wounded Knee. And I told him, well, I can do one or the other, but I can't do them both. I said, I can either fly the plane and do that or take care of the patient and not fly the plane. 
And she's like, well, she's like, we'll leave it to you to figure it out, but we need you to take this supplies to Wounded Knee. So I figured it wasn't an obscene phone call. I called her back and she answered it wasn't an obscene phone call. So I made a pot of coffee and I set up and I called, I thought, how the heck am I going to get? Because they told me I had 650 pounds worth of food and medicine already stashed in Denver in a certain location. We had to transport it to the airport to have it airlifted to, Den to Wounded Knee. So I thought, okay, and I'll just name this other guy, I'll just give him a, a, pick a name out of the sky, Jesse. We just call him Jesse. A friend and he had a Volkswagen and uh, we made, I don't know, like three or four trips from the stash place in downtown Denver by the Capitol Hill area, all the way to the late Stapleton International Airport. Uh, and so we loaded the, the, oh, first of all, before I did that, I figured, how am I gonna do this? So I started thinking over my coffee and I thought, the media, man, they're sending people out there to cover the story. So I started calling around and finally CBS says, yeah, we'll fly you and your medical supplies to Wounded Knee, at least to uh, um, Pine Ridge. That's the closest place to land the Lear jet was Pine Ridge. So I said, that's fine. We made all the trips, loaded the Lear jet. They inspected everything to make sure there was nothing illegal on there like guns or w ammunition or that kind of thing. None of that was allowed. Medications of all types were, were allowed because they're part of the humane uh, society's uh, allowance of international aid, you know, uh, is food and medical supplies. So we got them to Pine Ridge and right there uh, confiscated by the FBI most of where we had. And they tried to convince me not to go inside a wounded knee. They had a barrier there, a roadblock. And in Denver, the people from the American Indian Movement told me, you have to fly this woman to, Den to Wounded Knee with you and pass her off as a nurse, because she's not a nurse. So I thought that would have been an interesting assignment. I thought, okay. So we got to the FBI checkpoint, and every time they would fire a medical question at her, I'd jump in between and try to muddy up the question, answer it in some medical terms that would confuse the FBI and not really answer their questions and, not, and get that chick off the hook. So finally, after a bunch of arguing with the cops, they finally let us through. They said, once you get past that demilitarized zone, they said, we can't help you anymore. And I said, you're the ones that I'm afraid of. I said, I'm not afraid of those people. I said, so you the scared of. So I, when I called CBS and I was calling around to see where I could get an aircraft, uh, I finally asked them the bottom line question. I said, how much am I going to owe you guys for, for using your jet? And they said, oh, if a big news story breaks, give us an hour lead over the rest of the media and we're even. And so I made that deal around three or four in the morning with CBS. Well, it comes three or four in the afternoon and I'm inside a wounded knee and we're having a plan for who's going to do quite in case there's an outbreak of injuries because there was a a lot of firefighting going on. And so we're making a plan. And uh, at this point, everything was calm. There was no shooting going on. But the people from the Native American group needed to kill a cow for food, so they shot a cow. And right away, the FBI used that as a pretext for opening fire on us, saying that we had fired on them first and nobody fired at them. They just killed this cow. So they opened fire, there was a big exchange back and forth of firefight, machine guns going back and forth from American Indian Movement against the FBI, the U.S. Marshals, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs Police, the National Guard. Uh, all of them were united against us, but we had 300 hostages. So as soon as the people from AIM saw that I had crossed the FBI's bullshit line, uh, they came over and welcomed us. They said, welcome to helping us out, man. So it comes, like, that happened. I got the plane by, we were in Pine Ridge by 9.30 in the morning. Uh, by 3.30 in the evening, I'm in the afternoon, I'm inside of Wounded Knee. 
and I've made a promise to uh, give him a big one hour lead if, I, if something happens. Uh, well, I come seven, between seven and eight that evening and there's a big firefight going on. There's machine gun fire going back and forth and you could see the tracers like sparks coming out of a grinder when you're sharpening an ax or something with a grinder and you could just see the tracers and there's one tracer for every five rounds of ammunition in the machine guns. So uh, one of the people, one of the warriors from the, from the perimeter came over and they said, we need to take a medic with us and run the perimeter and see if any of our people have been hit. So nobody wanted to go. I said, I'll go, I'll run with you, man. And we took off running. And I saw the fire coming from two different places like this. You could just see the line of, of bullets coming at me. There was nowhere to hide. The road, there was no drop to the sides, it was flat. On both sides of the road, it was just flat. There was no place to hide. So I kept running at top speed, and the next thing that I knew, I'm doing the gravel bit on the pavement. And I felt everything hurt, but the bullet, I didn't know why I had been shot. Because when I got shot, it just felt like I had been hit by a piece of gravel in the gut. So like, thud, and it didn't hurt. What hurt was that I was running at a real high speed, and I didn't have a helmet or nothing. And the road rash, you know, it's like being thrown from a bike. I got hit on the pavement and I had a lot of road rash. Well, that became the big news story. Sophomore at the University of Colorado gets wounded in wounded knee. So I gave that to CBS and right away the other news networks like Sam Donaldson from ABC jumped in. Why CBS? I'm telling them I don't have to answer any questions for anybody other than CBS. Everybody else, get out. Everybody out except for the medicine men and CBS. And so there was a doctor there. He was wanting to call a helicopter and have me evacuated to Denver or to a Rapid City where they could do the proper surgery to get the bullet out. But the medicine men there said, no, this is our clinic and we're going to take the bullet out. So I'm laying on this mattress on the floor and the doctor's examining me from our blood pressure and vital signs and things, him and a paramedic. And uh, Leonard Crowdog, I noticed, had a little cabinet, maybe two feet by two feet by maybe 10 inches deep. And he went to his medicine cabinet and pulled out a jar and he got three roots and he chewed them in his mouth. Then he took that and he put it in the bullet hole, which wasn't bleeding very much, just very little. It was escaping from my body, most I was bleeding inside. So he put it on the bullet hole. And by this time, I was like real sleepy. I'd lost so much blood that I didn't really, I wasn't scared of dying. I knew that was a possibility, but that didn't scare me. The only thing, the only memory that I have is of being real sad because I hadn't told my family where I was going when I went. And I had promised them I would always keep them, you know, informed of anything that I was doing extra curricular that didn't have anything to do with the university. So I didn't tell them and I thought, shit, if I get killed, man, they're gonna hear about it in the obituaries. And I didn't tell him nothing. I felt pretty bad about that. But anyway, I didn't feel bad about it. If, if I was going to die, so be it. That was going to be it. I didn't care. Uh, they hauled me back to the clinic, two people. Medicine man cut me open with his pocket knife. He sharpened his pocket knife on the stone. And he cut me where the bullet hole was. And I kept hearing the doctor being very reassuring, saying, this guy's really good. He's not damaging any other tissue other than what the bullet damaged. He's in searching of the bullets, he's really good. So I kept hearing this, he's really good from the doctor. That was pretty reassuring because to see, see I was used to like operating room sterile technique where you didn't even put your hands in front of your face to breathe in them even nothing. Your hands are always behind your face uh, to prevent any kind of germs from getting, from escaping. But here I'm seeing this guy chewing things and then sticking them in the bullet hole. And that, that somehow registered a little funny with me. But I wasn't scared. And it didn't hurt. When he cut me open, I didn't feel any pain at all until he hit the bullet. Once he touched the bullet, that hurt. But then he quit cutting and he went in with some nose pliers, nose needle pliers, and got the bullet. And when he grabbed the bullet, that hurt until he got it out of my system, out of my body. Once the bullet was out of my body, the pain was gone that quick. It came that quick, and it went that quick. I mean, as soon as 
the bullet was out of my body, the pain was gone. And uh, so uh, I was one of the first 500 students that the uh, University of Colorado Law students recruited to the university uh, and they risked their careers and everything by demanding that the university retain enough scholarships to bring in 500 Chicanos on campus the next year. So finally the regents agreed to a lot, make 500 allocations to Chicanos and uh, I was one of the ones that qualified for the scholarship. Then at that point, I went on a demonstration against Kiriyama carnations and roses. That was my first experience with negative things with farm workers because I had been raised in San Acaso on farm work. And we took good care of our people that worked for my family. They took good care of them. Uh, and, and this place in Brighton was terrible. The living conditions were deplorable. They were horrible. So the university students got together with the people from Brighton. I don't know how we got connected, but we did. And uh, so we're demonstrating against K Kiriyama carnations and roses. And he had about 500 employees. And of the 500, only about 10 or 15 didn't cross the line. Everybody else walked out. So the fields of carnations and roses rotted. They went down the tubes. And from that moment on, I knew that I had more to do in college than be a student. I had to participate in what was going on around me. What was going on around me was a revolution, an educational revolution. So I still believe in what's happening over here in La Sierra. Uh, I've been involved with the land grant issue since uh, I can remember, but my grandfather in 1960 was one of the first people to become plaintiff so long with Apolinar Rael and Juan Lacombe and some other elders uh, to file a lawsuit against Taylor. And that was in 1960. And uh, we used to love coming up here to La Sierra to bring the sheep to graze them for the summer and then coming back and ride the horses, to take them back to the ranch in the fall. Uh, but I noticed that we had something to do over here. The logging was just going to destroy the watershed. The water, everybody in agriculture in San Acacio, and Chama, and El Rito, starting in El Rito and going all the way down to San Acacio, depends on the water from this mountain back here. And by cutting the trees, you cut the canopy. So the sun hits the snow, and it melts in February and March. And instead of having any water to irrigate in June, July, and August, the snow has melted. By that point, by you know early spring, there's no more water left, so a lot of people had to quit farming and leave the area. A lot of people have gone out and become educated and left the area because of lack of opportunities in the area, and then retired and have come back. Some have come back to live here and have done a lot of work. Juan Espinosa and David Martinez from La Cucaracha, as I recall, were the first newspaper to start informing the community of the treaty violations, because this was a land grant. So it was a violation of a treaty that we had signed with Mexico, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And David Martinez, being a very well-educated scholar, started a newspaper called La Cucaracha. And, uh, and he started educating the community about the abuse of the land grant by Taylor. We decided that the only way to do it would be to fight him in the courts. And it became obvious to us that while the courts were going on, the mountain was being destroyed by logging. I mean, I believe in thinning out a forest properly, so that you reduce a fire hazard. There's a correct way to do that. But you don't clear cut. You just take and you take thin out the forest. You take out the old trees, the dead trees, take those out. That leaves room for the healthier trees to grow. But this guy over here in La Sierra, Taylor, was just clear cutting the whole area, destroying our watershed, uh, further eroding people's ability to live off their small plots of land where they grew the food to sustain them through the winter and the next summer until the next harvest. And uh, so a lot of people, because of that reason, because they couldn't no longer sustain themselves agriculturally, left the area and um, I don't know how many decades it's going to take.
before we ever see harvesting size timber ever grow back on the Sierra. It won't be in my lifetime. Probably won't be in yours either. So it's going to be a long time before we uh, fix the damage that was done by logging. Uh, at that time, I did something that I normally do peacefully and with nonviolence. I chained myself down to a cattle guard, metal cattle guard that was designed by a local engineer, who I'm very proud to say is my friend. And he designed the cattle guard so that there was no way he could take me out without cutting the cattle guard and cutting my head off at the same time. So he designed it and uh, the local iron workers, the local welders, they put it together. They welded the metal and put it, made it the way the engineer designed it. And then I was elected to get chained down to the cattle guard. So we made a lock box where I could stick my hand in and lock myself with a chain around my wrist and then throw a carabiner and lock it inside this lock box, which was two tubes about this big around, just enough for my hands and my arms to fit in. And they went in and then with a carabiner, there was a metal a bar crossing inside the, the tool to lock myself down, the lock, locking tool. There was a crossbar and I locked myself into that. There was no way the cops could get to it. There's no way they could get to it and try to unlock me. So for 77 hours, they finally gave up in frustration and called the Alamosa Rescue Squad to come and get me out. But what happened was that in that 77 hours, chaining myself to a cattle guard. The media says, if it bleeds, it leads. So, you know, when you chain yourself to a cattle guard like that, the possibility of a, one of those logging trucks running over me was very real. It was a very distinct possibility. Some idiot redneck, you know, just angry at the protesters could have run over me. I was in danger. When you do something like that, uh, you have to have your best people on, uh, on the ground next to you, because if not, uh, you could very easily die. Uh, the foreman of the Taylor Ranch tried to run me over, a guy by the name of Vic White. But the late Andrew Espinosa jumped up and grabbed him by the collar and he, by the throat, and he told him, don't do something crazy so that I won't have to do something crazy. And the guy hit his brakes and he came skidding. He came within maybe three feet from running over my head with his truck, but if it hadn't been for Andres Espinosa, he would have killed me. So that's, you know, but still, at the end, I still gave him the peace sign. So I believe in, in nonviolence. I believe in peaceful demonstration and organizing of people. And I think everybody should organize and unite on the certain issues. I have a lot of people around me, all the environmentalists, the protesters that have come to support us would make a circle around the area where I was locked down. But still, you know, yeah, of course, I was thinking that a semi, nobody can stop one of those trucks, you know. And I, and I was at the bottom of a hill, so a logging truck could come down, lose their brakes. You can't turn them in the mountains going down, you know, that goes straight. They would run them. So yeah, I did, I did think about a little danger once in a while. It, it occurred to me that I could have gotten run over. But still, it was important enough to me to get the word out, to get the word out to the community of what was being done, to get the courts to listen to us and to get an injunction against the logging and granting us those injunctions. Uh, it was a natural high. It was just a real natural high. I mean, it was like we had been swimming and swimming and swimming upstream for a long time. Finally, we had gotten to the riverbank. You know, and we couldn't believe it. everybody was jumping up in joy. And we were still, in the, you know, for the next six weeks after it happened, six to eight weeks, everybody still couldn't talk. We were also in a state of shock because we had been, you know, how long had it been that we had been fighting this? You know, like 40 years, more, you know. So, so when we won in the Supreme Court, I thought, it was all worth it, man. It was all worth it. And again, we did that with no violence because there were people that tried to shoot Taylor. They weren't, and he deserved to have gotten shot. If they had killed him, I wouldn't have been sorry because of what he did. There were three people up here riding on horseback looking for their steer. 
in the fall, round up their cattle and take them home. They were missing a steer. So they went looking for their steer and Taylor and his ranch hands got him and assaulted him dangerously, almost killed him with weapons and then tied him up like if they were an injured lion or something in the back of a truck or took him to jail and one of them arrested. The sheriff arrested him instead. And people were so angry that the sheriff had to come out and plead with people not to go shoot him. Because there was somebody standing over there with a 30-30 uh, aiming to shoot Taylor through the jail. And the sheriff said, I'm not going to stop you. He said, but please don't shoot him. We can do better by not shooting him. We can beat him in the courts. Don't shoot him. So they finally agreed not to shoot him. But the people that were drunk, we were afraid they weren't going to listen. They were going to shoot him anyway, you know. But no, they didn't. The sheriff talked everybody out of it. But yeah, he, he came close to getting shot. No, just partial access, uh, grazing, uh, wood gathering, uh, trees for building corrals and things like that. We didn't get back recreation, no fishing or hunting privileges, but that's an appeal. That part of the uh, decision is being appealed right now. I hope that the fact that we went as far as the Supreme Court to get our ruling, that the lower courts would say, you know, it's about time that we brought this saga to an end. You know, but I can't predict what the judges and the courts will do. They're unpredictable. Yes, the, well, the, the, the land grant heirs will pass on to their children the same rights that we got and the children's children and so forth. And the rights that we didn't get are on appeal, like I said, hunting and fishing are important and those were not approved in the decision. So that's on appeal and, and hopefully, hopefully soon people will be able to come and take home their meat and their fish and things like they used to before. They'd kill an elk or a deer or something and they had meat for the winter, you know. And depending on how big the family was, sometimes they needed to kill too, you know. But since uh, Taylor became owner and it got into private hands, it's been one disaster after the next, after the next, after the next for the people. You know, winning was like, like I said, I felt like I was on a drug and I knew I wasn't, but I was just so unbelievably excited about the victory. Uh, but we still haven't crossed the other bridge. When we can get in here without a key and we can go fishing and hunting, not that I eat fish or animals, but the people that do, they can come and hunt and fish, and feed their families, and they'll come over here and take pictures and hike, climb, walk around. That's my trip, ride a horse, horseback. That would be my trip. Um, it's very private, it's very personal. It's, that's my, my dedication to nonviolence to animals. So by not wearing leather or down gear or eating anything that comes from an animal, then they have no reason to kill the animal because I'm not going to eat it. You know, I have no reason to raise chickens because I'm not going to eat their eggs. I'm not going to eat the chickens either. So that way they don't have to kill animals for me to be happy. And I'm always happy at the dinner table, believe me. I eat with a smile from ear to ear, man because I know that my food didn't cause any injury to any animal. See, I grew up with little animals, raising them. Pencos, baby sheep, we would bottle feed them until they grew up. And uh, in the fall, when they were getting ready to send the big herd to market, the semis would come over and start loading them up. But the night that they would put them in the corral, with all the sheep they'd put in, the ones that we had raised bottle fed, the pencos, they put them in together to send them to Denver. Well, the four hobbits, my two brothers and my sister and I, would get up about at two in the morning when everybody was sleeping and we tipped out there and called the sheep while they would come to us like dogs, you know, as soon as they saw us. Here's a bottle, they come running. 
So we go and we take them about 2 o'clock in the morning from the house, about a quarter of a mile across two ditches and two fields, about a quarter of a mile into La Vega. And they would be like counting them as they were loading them on the same and they would say, darn it, we're still missing 14 sheep. What happened? And then they would finally snap and say, how many penko did the kids raise? 14. So they'd pull out their binoculars and look at the Vega. Sure enough, there'd be 14 penkos over there grazing very happy. <laughs> so that's why I became a vegetarian. I don't like to kill animals. Oh man, because without knowing your history, you can't really prepare and plan for your future. You know, and, and by knowing the history of this area, and how people used it and survived in it, then we can pass that along to other generations so they also can live off the land, you know, properly, uh, in harmony with the land. Uh, it doesn't harm it to take dead wood out of it. That's good for firewood. It doesn't harm the forest at all. So don't want to take and do clear cutting and just rape the mountain. You know, so, so it's very important that uh, this history of the use of this mountain be passed on to other generations. So that eventually, someday those trees will grow back. It's not going to be in our lifetime, but it'll probably be in theirs, children's lifetime. Uh, to organize as a group and, and uh, look up the approaches and the obstacles that we overcame in the process, in the courts, you know, and look at that as a way of understanding how the system works and how to get around their rules and regulations. Uh, so that's what I would say to the people in Antonita. I would say, well, you know, talk to the people in San Luis that actually had a part in it, that, that were actually witnesses and plaintiffs and the whole thing in the case. Uh, and and then organize your own organization, your own grant, land grant organization, and, and, and file, you know. And, and the only thing that I would say is do it with nonviolence, but uh, don't push away the offer of security. There are some people that will say, look, what you guys are doing could be politically dangerous. Somebody could get hurt. And it is possible. Get somebody that you trust for security to make sure that they got your back. Because if you're going to go after somebody who owns land and you're going after their land, there's going to be a confrontation, I guarantee it. Like we had here. You know, big corporations are the devil. You know, oil diggers, they're the devil, man. They're the enemy. And they'll go to any length and go through any extremes to fatten up their bank accounts. So don't underestimate the enemy. I call them the enemy because they are the enemy. They're not allied with us, so they're against us. You know, if they're going to drill for oil and they're going to poison your water that you drink, think about whether or not you want to let them drill for oil there. If there's a possibility that something can go wrong, I guarantee you it will go wrong. We said that about the gold mining operation here, and now we're living with the consequences of it. You know, we told them about it in advance before they opened it. Oh, but it'll create new jobs. Well, when I called that county commissioner a thief, I actually, I didn't call him a thief, I got up and asked him, I said, how much did they fatten up your bank account in order for you to support the multi-million dollar corporation from Golden, Colorado against the people that put you in office? And he just bent his head down, he didn't answer my question. So at noon I was eating at Emma's Hacienda and he came and he grabbed me in a chokehold like that and he pulled me out of the booth and everything went black. But being in the Marines, I had a lot of training in self-defense and all the flashes of the moves came back to me like a dancer. I just grabbed him and I neutered him. I had no choice. She weighed about 350 pounds. I only weighed about 120, 130. 
and he weighed pretty close to 350. And he had me in a chokehold until everything went black. I had my eyes open, but I, everything was going black. I knew I had only seconds to react or it was going to be all over. And I reacted as I had been trained and I neutered him. And to this day, the man sees me and he won't talk to me, but he, does, he hasn't shot me or anything. <laughs> uh, go back, like I said, history is really important. Go back to figuring out how people survived off the land before there were uh, chemical corporations around making chemicals for the land. Because they say that it's for the benefit of the land, they can't convince me of it. It was a beautiful land when I was a little kid, before they started inventing those chemicals and promoting their use. Uh, and, I mean, the mountains, you came up here and there was a fragrance in the air, just a beautiful fragrance. Because everything was green and lush and beautiful. But now you go down towards Santa Casa and that area in there where, uh, where they've cut back on the farming because of the lack of water. Now you don't have that fragrance there anymore. We used to have uh, frogs in the Vega. Frogs and snakes of all kinds. We used to go catch them as little kids. And now they're none to be found. It's pretty sad. So I would say, yeah, take care of the land in a natural way in a natural way. Uh, clean it up. If it didn't grow there, it don't belong there. You know, if it's not part of the mineral earth, if it's not part of the earth itself. If it didn't grow there, it's litter. You know, I mean, I don't see any litter here. I see good fertilizer that was deposited by the elk. You know, I mean, that's what I'm saying about for the future. Use the land, but don't abuse it. It's in an environmentally friendly way, you know, and uh, dairy farms have tons and tons of manure they'd like to get rid of. People can use it in their gardens and their farms and plow it in and disc it in. Before they know it, they'll be able to grow whatever they please and the soil will produce densely. <laughs>